Okay, so um, we'll see if we'll have a time to uh, analyze a complete CT scan together. Uh, but uh, what we'll be going over the next uh, 20 minutes or so is uh, a few uh, important concepts uh, that are probably not uh, in the uh, traditional sense uh, what we do every day for TAVR, uh, but uh, I think it may spark up some good discussions afterwards. Um, you know, given this is a, an imaging talk and uh, later on today we will be talking about uh, imaging in the mitral valve, uh, something that I've come to appreciate over the last uh, few years is this concept of translating cardiac imaging uh, from the human uh, heart specimen uh, through echo to fluoroscopy, through MRI, through CT. So what you see here uh, in these images are three chamber views. Um, of the heart, and you can get that on echo, you can get that on fluoro, you can get that on MRI, you can get that on CT, and they're always showing you the same thing. So when we hear talks about the uh, anatomy of the mitral valve or the aortic valve or the tricuspid valve or the pulmonary valve, people always start talking about the actual structures associated uh, with these uh, valves. For instance, they speak about the uh, coronary sinuses and the LVOT and uh, maybe the sinotubular junction. But sometimes it's interesting to understand heart valve anatomy by understanding the chamber views of the heart. So really, we can only appreciate the heart in three typical chambers. It's the three-chamber view, the two-chamber view, and the on-fast view of the, uh, of the valve. Uh, there's a number of uh, softwares you can use to analyze uh, the CT. And something that was uh, a little bit revolutionary, at least for myself and our team uh, back at home, was uh, really to translate the knowledge from CT scan to your uh, C-arm or fluoroscopy suite. Um, and in order to do this, it's very important to understand the heart and its attitudinal description, meaning what's anterior, posterior, right, left, and superior and inferior. Um, it's very difficult to understand the echocardiographer when they start talking about anteral septal and infralateral and medial septal. Uh, you know, you really don't know uh, how to communicate those types of locations in the heart. But if you stick to this nomenclature, um, you can really uh, communicate uh, through, uh, throughout the different imaging modalities. So how do you go from CT to fluoroscopy? Uh, is first to understand the transverse or short axis view of the heart. This is um, uh, what you see here, the anterior aspect of the heart. So that's the anterior aspect of the heart. That's the posterior. That's right and that's left. Um, and if you view the heart from uh, this side while uh, the patient's lying down on the table, this would be the back of the patient with uh, the patient lying on the table. Feet would be coming out you and the head probably inside the, the screen there. This would be an REO view from a... Uh, from the zero line, the horizontal line, going across the sternum and the spine. Um, and likewise, uh, you can also look at this from an LAO perspective, and you can calculate that angle in order to give you a particular LAO or REO. In order to understand what's cranio-oncotal, you gotta look at the sagittal view. So superior is where the head is, inferior where the feet are. You have the sternum here, anterior, and the spine, posterior. And so if your eye is looking from the midline here and goes up, it goes a certain degree cranial, and it comes a certain degree caudal. So you can calculate, actually, that displacement as an angle. In this case, it would be about cranial 45. Now, when you look at uh, the aortic valve, uh, you can obtain the aortic valve in plane in multiple views. And um, we use the S-curve uh, of these valves in order to describe every LAO or REO where there's a cranial and caudal position where the valve is in plane. And really, we're, we're limited with our C-arms. We can only go so much LAO and so much REO and cranial and caudal. So you can see here that we have a two-chamber view of the heart, which is typically obtained in the shallow LAO cranial view. And you see the aortic valve here is in plane, uh, depicted by that yellow line. If you come to the REO caudal view, uh, you'll end up in a three-chamber view. So anytime your C-arm goes into an REO caudal view, you are in a three-chamber view. Anytime you go into a shallow LAO cranial view, you're in a two-chamber view. And if you want to obtain the on-fast view of the aortic valve, it's typically in an extreme REO cranial view. Now, later on today, we're going to be discussing the mitral valve, but just to give you a little heads up, you can see that this is the S-curve of the mitral valve. 
that is for every uh, RAO and LAO, you have a corresponding cranial and caudal where the uh, mitral valve is in plane. And if you ride up along this curve, you notice that you, uh, if you go extremely RAO caudal, again, you have the um, uh, mitral valve in plane in a three-chamber view, but as you come up towards the shallow LAO, you end up in a two-chamber view. And of course, an extreme LAO cranial is the same as an extreme RAO caudal, except the images are mirror images of each other. And for the uh, mitral valve, the omphas view is in the opposite quadrant uh, in an LAO caudal view. And it's also very interesting when we teach our fellows uh, at, at McGill uh, that the coronary anatomy can also be learned uh, in, in the chamber views of the heart. Uh, and so what we'll see later on today, we'll be describing uh, some mitral valve anatomy. Uh, you can really summarize uh, the, the anatomy of the heart uh, based on the chamber view. So for instance, in the two chamber view, uh, and of course you're appreciating the patient from an anterior posterior direction and we're made wide from an anterior to posterior perspective and we're made narrow from a right to left perspective. So in a two chamber view where you appreciate the more or less AP view of the heart, you have that two chamber view and it makes sense that your aortic annulus is largest, your mitral valve annulus is largest, uh, your papillary muscles are maximally separated, uh, you can differentiate between your anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets in the two-chamber view, uh, but you can understand where is your segment one, two, and three of the mitral valve. Um, and in the two-chamber view, you have an overlapping of the mitral and aortic valves. If you go to the right-hand side of the screen, um, in the three-chamber view, now we're sort of appreciating the patient more from a right-to-left perspective. We're made narrow in that view. And so here you get the shortest diameter of the aortic annulus. Here you get the shortest diameter of the mitral valve. The papillary muscles are overlapping in a three-chamber view. You can differentiate between the anterior and posterior mitral valve. So here's the anterior mitral valve. Here's the posterior mitral valve. But of course, on fluoroscopy, the segments of the anterior mitral valve are overlapping. Um, and you have separation of aortic and mitral valves. And some of these views, the two-chamber, three-chamber view, might be uh, interesting. Uh, for instance, when you're implanting a mitral valve, you might want to separate your aortic from your mitral valve. You might want to understand on the two-chamber view the separation of the papillary muscles, so you can understand uh, what depth the papillary muscles are coming from the mitral valve. Um, you know, if you look at the three-chamber view, this is the same three-chamber view we get on echo. And historically, back 10 years ago, when we were sizing transcatheter valves, we were sizing it based on the three-chamber view uh, uh, on echo, and we kept on saying that we were underestimating the um, aortic annulus diameter. Well, in fact, if you start to understand how to analyze the CT scan, you can understand that we get the shortest diameter of the aortic annulus in the three-chamber view, and we were never appreciating the largest diameter on the aortic annulus. And I remember many cases in Rotterdam where we'd go to the cath lab and the echo would suggest a small transcatheter valve based on the echo because we were measuring the three-chamber view. Then we'd do the aortogram and Patrick uh, or Peter would say, oh, no, 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 you know, we have to take a, a larger valve because that, aor that aorta looks extremely large. We would do some quantitative uh, analysis on that uh, aortogram and we would switch to a larger valve. Well, that's because we were appreciating the largest diameter of the aortic annulus. Um, so it becomes very interesting uh, historically to start realizing what we were doing uh, right and wrong. Now the S-curve of the aortic annulus is also interesting to understand the 3D uh, anatomy of the heart. So here you have three patients with three different uh, aortic annuli S-curves. And you see that going from left to right, you go from a more horizontal to more vertical annulus. So what can this uh, help us understand with respect to the challenges we might uh, expect during a case? Well, let's take the left-hand side. If you, under, if you uh, wanna take uh, or you wanna understand uh, if you have a horizontal annulus, let's say, and you want to understand uh, the views in which this annulus is in plane, if it's truly horizontal, we'll take that extreme view, you've got to go from RAO to LAO in order to get all the particular views of that annulus in plane. On the other hand, if you have a very vertical annulus, okay, you're going to have to sweep your C-arm from cranial to caudal uh, in order to uh, see your annulus in plane. Now imagine plotting this on your uh, S-curve. You'll notice that on the far right, uh, this is patient number three, you can appreciate that this is a very vertical annulus uh, or horizontal aorta as we can say. 
uh, and that the S-curve is very vertical. And that we, we can then make a generalization that if you have a very vertical S-curve, then you have a very vertical aortic annulus. And if you have a very horizontal S-curve, you have a very horizontal uh, uh, annulus. Now, when we're looking at implanting valves, we saw a nice case uh, demonstration today of uh, obtaining the aortic annulus in plane. Uh, and um, of course, this is one method uh, to implant a valve, but what typically happens is that you get the aortic annulus in plane, but you end up with the delivery catheter out of plane. The other uh, method of implanting uh, a valve is getting the delivery catheter in plane, as you see here at the bottom uh, middle picture. Uh, but what ends up happening is that you might get the aortic annulus out of plane. So the problem with these two current implant methods is that you get foreshortening of either the delivery catheter or the aortic annulus. And so the solution uh, to this is to get both the aortic annulus and delivery catheter in plane. And there's actually one fluoroscopic view where both the delivery catheter and annulus are in plane. And when we're talking about implanting valves at two millimeters and three millimeters or five millimeters, imagine how accurate we need to be. And so if you're off by 20 degrees in one of these uh, structures, whether it's your annulus or delivery catheter, you may be um, uh, foreshortening enough that you may not be getting that actual two millimeter depth you think you're getting. So how do we achieve uh, getting the uh, both the annulus and delivery catheter in plane. Uh, so what we do first is get the aortic annulus um, and we generate its S-curve based on CT scan and analyzing that CT scan. The second step, it happens during the procedure in fact. Uh, and so once the delivery catheter is through the annulus, you need to get two views of that delivery catheter in plane. And something I didn't share with you, uh, but is also but very interesting to this whole concept is that uh, in order to generate an S-curve of any disk in 3D space, you need two types of information. You either need two views of that disk in plane, or you need its on-fast viewing angle. If you have those two different types of information, you can generate an S-curve of any disk in 3D plane. So we treat the radiopaque marker of the core valve as a disk. And so we get two views of this delivery catheter in plane, we impute these views into floral CT. And what we get is uh, the generation of two curves. The one in blue here is the delivery catheter that describes uh, every view. There's an LAO and RAO where the, uh, there's, for every RAO and LAO, there's a cranial cauda where the delivery catheter is in plane. And of course, we have the typical aortic annulus. And in this case, they uh, intersect uh, at an RAO 20, caudal 30, and in this view you would have both the annulus and the delivery catheter in plane. And this is how uh, the result is during the procedure. You see here the annulus is in plane and the delivery catheter in plane. And in this view, and only in this view really can you understand the depth of implant. Um, what typically happens in the cath lab when you're foreshortened is you tend to push things or maybe pull things uh, out uh, too much uh, until you realize uh, that maybe you're too deep or too shallow. So after doing this in about uh, 300 patients or so, um, we start to realize that about 90 to 95 percent of the um, uh, intersections are in some REO caudal view. And we ask ourselves, you know, why was this happening? Well, if we go back to the two-chamber and three-chamber view, uh, what you start to notice that in the two-chamber view, you have a foreshortened LVOT. The LVOT here looks um, uh, short uh, relative to its uh, three-chamber view. And so, of course, the delivery catheter takes the path of the anatomy. Uh, of course, it's not coaxial, uh, and it's not running in the center line of the uh, aortic anatomy, but it does generally take the path of the uh, anatomy. Um, and so if the anatomy is least foreshortened in a three-chamber view, your catheter is probably least foreshortened in some three-chamber view as well. So this is one of the explanations uh, of why uh, implanting in a three-chamber view or a steep areal caudal view uh, is what we see with the double S curve. Now, let's take this example here. Uh, this was a case I was doing in China. Um, and uh, we're in an LAO18 cranial four. We would say this is a potentially traditional view of implanting a transcatheter valve. Now, 
if we were to ask a bunch of experts of what we should do here, um, we would have probably think that this valve is maybe positioned super annular. So you can see here part of the frame appears to be within the sinuses. And that we would perhaps maybe recapture or maybe pull the valve out of its uh, annulus and try to recapture it in the sheath. Well, when you go into the three-chamber view on echo, okay, this was done simultaneously. On the three-chamber view on echo, look at the depth of the valve, okay? We are very deep, okay? Yet the fluoroscopy in the traditional view is suggesting that we're too high. Now, the three-chamber view on echo is also the three-chamber view on fluoroscopy in the areo caudal view. So let's go into the double S areo caudal view. And this is what we got, okay? So in fact, we were not too high. We were at the appropriate depth, okay? And we're probably deploying our valves way too deep in the vast majority of cases because in this view, what you'd probably want to do is potentially push your valve deeper, okay? And if you analyze post-op CT scans of patients who have undergone TAVI, you start to realize that the implantation depths uh, are much deeper than intended. Um, and of course, if we measure the depth of implant in a traditional view on, on fluoroscopy, uh, then we, we uh, are not measuring the true depth. The only way to measure the true depth uh, is by using the double S view or by using the CT scan. So um, the other concept I want to bring up, and it's something that is, uh, we've been talking a lot about in the last few months, is superannular sizing. And a lot of this work uh, has come from China, in fact. Um, and uh, we've been uh, implanting a new transcatheter valve there. Uh, and about s the mean age of patients in China is about 74, 75, and the most common reason for surgical aortic valve replacement in younger patients is bicuspid valve disease. And uh, one of the things that we've been uh, noticing in China was that uh, physicians were selecting a smaller valve size uh, than, was, than was suggested by the aortic annulus, but still getting good results. So when we measure the aortic annulus, this is Mount Everest, uh, hovering the border of China. Um, when we measure the aortic annulus, we typically uh, measure the uh, basal attachment, at the level of the basal attachments of the aortic valve leaflets. Uh, but what we're talking about now is maybe doing superannular measurements and seeing how that might influence valve size selection. So in order to seal, uh, you need three things for a transcatheotic valve. You need the valve to be conformable, at least to, so that it can oppose against the, uh, the anatomy. You need for it to have appropriate radial force so it can displace the calcium. Um, and you need to have the right valve dimensions for that particular anatomy. And if you look at the uh, post-op CT scans uh, of patients undergoing TAVR, what you realize, uh, this is all the same patient, by the way, seen in different views. What you see in bright green are the areas of the core valve that are in contact with the anatomy, and those in uh, more um, opaque green are those that are not in contact. You see that the region of contact uh, is uh, not only at the annulus, but it occurs across the leaflets and into the LVOT. So let me show you this case from China uh, where we use the microport valve. It has a similar shape to a core valve, uh, but uh, it has much more radial force, um, and it also has a skirt uh, like a Sapien 3. And when we talk about a 24 valve, that's very similar to a 26 core valve, and when we talk about a 27 valve, it's very similar to a uh, 29 core valve. So here's the annular uh, sizing of this patient, a uh, perimeter of 71.4 with a derived diameter of 22.7. And if we just look at the sizing chart, which is a little bit difficult to see, it provides you all the different uh, valve companies uh, with the different valve sizes and the amount of oversizing um, based uh, according to the valve size and for that particular uh, annulus. You see that here, uh, we, it would suggest to implant a um, 26 uh, millimeter core valve. Now let's look at the distribution of uh, and quantification of calcium. Here we have uh, about uh, 742 millimeter cubed of calcium, so moderate we would say. 
And let's run this video as we scroll up and down the aortic annulus. Okay, what you can notice is that, of course, we, uh, we can potentially see a neoannulus. Okay, so if you look at this here, and now we're gonna superimpose the original aortic annulus. So that's the superannular sizing, and what you see in purple is the original aortic annulus. Okay, so you see that the dimensions went from 76.8 to down to 71. And if we compare the aortic annulus, which suggests a 29 millimeter core valve, if we go super annular, it changes to a 26 millimeter core valve, okay? So in this particular patient, what we did was uh, we went not with the larger Chinese valve, we went with the smaller Chinese valve, which is similar to a 26. We did a balloon valvuloplasty. And uh, we took the two views in order to get the valve in plane. We, we did the double S view. In this case, it was a, a shallow RAO caudal 29. Um, and you can see here the uh, typical deployment phases, okay? And here's the final angiogram of that patient, okay? If we were to follow the recommendations of the annulus, we would take the 29 millimeter equivalent or the 27 millimeter Chinese valve, but here we went for the 24. I'll show, I'll show you a very quick uh, second case uh, here, perimeter of 82. It would suggest a 31 millimeter core valve. It would suggest not to implant this valve um, in the Chi with the available Chinese uh, valve sizes available. Uh, this was a bicuspid patient. Uh, you see there was 1,500 millimeter cubed of calcium. And so let's look at this case. And we're scrolling up and down. You can see that there's commissural fusion at, uh, or the RAFE at 12 o'clock. And if you just come slightly above the annulus, you see that there's a new annulus that you've created. Okay, and this is and this is one of the reasons why uh, sometimes we hear of the Lotus valve or the Sapien 3 valve, which have 0% oversizing, or they say minus 5% oversizing, uh, and they're still anchoring. It's because the anchoring and sealing is happening within the leaflets. So you see here that this uh, case would suggest that a 31 millimeter core valve would need to be implanted. Um, you'll see that we'll select the aortic annulus. Okay, 31 millimeter core valve highlighted in blue, we'll go to the superannular sizing, you see it jumped to 29, okay? And this is also why a lot of times when you hear about bicuspid valves, people choosing a valve size smaller, it's because you have a, a superannulus uh, there that can uh, act as a place for anchoring and sealing of the valve. Um, so just to show you, this again was we used a double S, this was an extreme Mario caudal view. Uh, you have the different phases of implant. You see that the annulus is in plane and the delivery catheter is in plane. And finally, we had to do some post-implant dilatation. Uh, but you can see here the depth of implant in the ceiling uh, is still acceptable uh, using a 27 millimeter microport valve when in fact the annulus would have suggested not to do this case at all. So with this, I'm gonna stop here. Uh, I wanted to share with you uh, these concepts of the double S curve and of the super annular sizing. Uh, that will probably uh, be changing the way we uh, size our valves and, and pre perform our procedures. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah,